Hello everyone, and welcome back to Nuclear Criticality Safety Lectures. Before we begin our journey into the core criticality safety material in this course, we'll take a brief detour into the realm of radiation biology. More specifically, today we'll discuss how different doses of radiation affect the human body, we'll define acute radiation syndrome and describe its mechanisms, and we'll review the first two criticality accidents, both of which involved the demon core and took place in Los Alamos. At the very end of this lecture, I will show some pictures of the scientists involved in these two accidents as they began to succumb to acute radiation syndrome. These pictures are somewhat graphic and might be disturbing to some people, so I'll warn you well in advance before I show them so that you can stop this lecture if you don't want to see them. These images aren't really as graphic as some of the things I've seen in horror movies, and if you've seen HBO's Chernobyl miniseries, I actually think that they are less graphic than Chernobyl's depiction of acute radiation syndrome. Nonetheless, I will pause the lecture and warn you before I show these images. It's helpful to define the units for radiation dose and radiation damage before we begin describing the health effects of radiation. One way of measuring a radiation dose is to measure the amount of energy that radiation deposits. Radiation damage occurs because radiation collides with our cells and breaks bonds in our DNA, so naturally it makes sense that a radiation source that deposits more energy in our body will result in more collisions with our cells and thus more potential damage to our DNA. The unit of grays, GY, corresponds to the absorbed dose, which is how much energy radiation deposits in our tissue. One gray is equal to one joule of energy deposited per one kilogram of tissue, which is actually a really enormous amount of dose. Radiation sickness begins at a dose of less than one gray. You can also describe the absorbed dose using units of rads, which is a somewhat more historical unit associated with Rentgens and early X-ray generators. One gray equals 100 rad, which also equals 100,000 millirad. These units are great for measuring the energy deposited by radiation in tissue, but the truth is that not all types of radiation deposit energy in precisely the same way. One type of radiation might impart its energy solely on a single unlucky electron, while another kind of radiation might be more likely to displace entire atoms and break bonds in our DNA. Because of this, the equivalent dose takes the absorbed dose and weights it by a radiation quality factor Q, which describes how likely different kinds of radiation are to damage tissue. The quality factor is highest at around 20 for alpha particles, fission products, and other heavy ions, and it equals 1 for X-rays, gamma rays, and beta particles. It also equals 0 for things like non-ionizing radiation, which don't contain enough energy to break the bonds in our cells. Now, the equivalent dose gives us a more accurate estimate for radiation dose, but it does not account for the fact that different tissues are radiosensitive to different degrees. Radiation generally affects our cells by damaging DNA in the cells as they are dividing, which means that organs that are rapidly growing cells or replacing old cells, such as bone marrow, skin, testes, are more radiosensitive than cells that do not divide rapidly, such as your muscles or your heart. The effective dose takes organ radiosensitivity into account by weighting the equivalent dose by a tissue weighting factor which describes the radiosensitivity of the organs where the dose is deposited. The sievert is the unit that describes the effective dose and also the equivalent dose, actually. You can convert grays of absorbed dose into units of sieverts for the effective dose by multiplying them by the appropriate radiation quality factor and tissue weighting factor. The rem is a second unit for describing the effective dose, and you can convert one rad into units of rem by multiplying it by the appropriate radiation quality and tissue weighting factors. A third unit for the effective dose is the millirem, which is just one one thousandth of a rem. On average, we receive about one millirem of dose every day from naturally occurring radioactive material, or NORM, so I find that the millirem is a convenient unit for visualizing and quantifying the magnitude of different radiation doses. So how much radiation dose is required to cause radiation sickness? Well, let's put that into perspective by seeing how much dose we get from some common everyday activities. As I mentioned before, we receive about one millirem of dose per day, or about 350 millirem of dose per year, which equals 3,500 microsieverts of dose, all from naturally occurring radioactive sources. These sources include cosmic rays, radon gas, 
naturally occurring radioactive isotopes, and medical procedures that we go through. This value also can vary by a factor of 2 to 3 based on your home's elevation, location, and its soil content. Higher elevations have less air to shield from cosmic rays, and because of this, people living in places like Denver, Colorado, or Albuquerque, New Mexico, receive about 80 millirem of extra dose per year compared to people living at sea level. Similarly, soils with a higher concentration of uranium or thorium will emit more radioactive radon gas, which gives us a radiation dose as we inhale it. The east coast of India has significant thorium deposits, which means that people who live in that area receive an extra about 380 millirem per year of dose just from that radon gas. Now, let's compare our annual radiation dose with the amount of dose that we receive from some other activities. For example, eating a banana gives you about 0.01 millirem, or 0.1 microsievert, of dose due to the radioactive potassium in the banana, while flying coast to coast in an airplane imparts about 4 millirem, or 40 microsieverts, of dose. Getting a chest x-ray, which most people incorrectly assume is a pretty significant radiation dose, only imparts between 2 to 10 millirems, 20 to 100 microsieverts, of dose. Now in some cases these doses might seem like a lot of radiation, but they really aren't. Moving from Savannah, Georgia to Denver, Colorado corresponds to getting roughly an extra 16 chest x-rays per year, but people in Denver don't have a higher cancer death rate than people in Savannah. In fact, they have a much lower cancer death rate. These maps show that there is no correlation between naturally occurring radiation doses and cancer death rates. In fact, if anything, they appear to be anti-correlated. It's likely that other factors, such as obesity rates, influence a population's cancer death rate much more than radiation, and that receiving 300 millirem of dose per year versus 450 millirem of dose makes no difference whatsoever. These radiation doses are all fairly small, so let's begin to escalate things. The Nuclear Regulatory Commission's annual dose limit for radiation workers is about 5,000 millirem per year, or 50 millisieverts per year, while the threshold for acute radiation syndrome, which is commonly known as radiation sickness, is about 14 times higher than this limit at 70,000 millirem, or 0.7 sieverts, of dose. The LD5030 dose, which is the dose that would be fatal 50% of the time 30 days following exposure, is about 3.5 sieverts, while a dose greater than somewhere around 5 to 8 sieverts is considered to be non-survivable. We'll discuss exactly why this dose is not survivable and the mechanisms by which they are fatal in a few minutes, but first let's answer the question, does the rate at which we receive a radiation dose matter? Is a radiation worker who hits their 5 rem dose limit in one day equally at risk for developing cancer later in life compared to a worker who receives their 5 rem limit slowly throughout the entire year? The minimum dose that has been linked to an increased risk of developing cancer is about 10,000 millirems, which is about 100 millisieverts or 0.1 sieverts. This limit was determined by studying the survivors of the Hiroshima and Nagasaki atomic bomb blasts and correlating their future cancer rates to the dose that they received in the bombings. This correlation is roughly linear, with the smallest statistically significant increase in cancer rates occurring at a roughly 10,000 millirem dose. So doses below this limit didn't actually see a statistically significant increase in cancer rates. Interestingly enough, our radiation dose limits and the regulations for building and operating nuclear power plants are based around taking this plot and extrapolating it down several orders of magnitude to doses in the several millirem range. This approach is known as the linear no-threshold model. Any statistician worth their salt knows that a plot that is extrapolated by several orders of magnitude has almost no predictive capability, but regulators assume that a linear no-threshold model is valid because it is inherently conservative. It overestimates the impact of low radiation doses, which might have no impact at all, and forces nuclear engineers to over-engineer systems and causes accidents to have less of a health effect on the population than predicted. In truth, there's not a ton of evidence for the linear no-threshold model, and receiving many small doses of radiation over a long period of time 
is less harmful than receiving one large dose all at once. It's just like how walking down a one-foot step a hundred times is less harmful than walking off a 100-foot cliff once. Our bodies have evolved around naturally occurring radioactive material, and because of this, our immune systems are able to detect and repair radiation damage quite well. In fact, the concept of radiation hormesis submits that small doses of radiation are actually good for us. Just like how getting a vaccine or a small cold can help stimulate our immune systems and defend against more severe colds, Radiation hormesis submits that small doses of radiation will stimulate our immune system's DNA repair mechanisms and decrease our odds of developing cancer. It might sound wacky at first, but there's actually a fair bit of evidence in support of radiation hormesis. Radiation damage has been observed to activate our enzymatic DNA repair mechanisms, as well as multiple genes, and to signal cell signaling mechanisms that tell our body where it has been damaged by radiation. Furthermore, the fact that immunosuppressed individuals see a significant increase in tumor growth suggests that our immune systems are actually quite good at suppressing cancerous tumors. There are several good epidemiological studies that also support the thesis of radiation hormesis. For example, several studies have found that exposure to higher levels of radon gas initially result in lower rates of lung cancer. Cancer rates increase as you get to higher and higher levels of radon gas but some radiation appears to be helpful. It's probably good for our regulators to assume that the linear no-threshold model is true because it forces our risk models to be inherently conservative, but it also makes nuclear facilities more expensive, more difficult, and slower to build. Making nuclear power plant construction slower and more expensive generally means that nuclear power plants will be supplanted by coal and other fossil sources of energy, which pose even more severe health risks than nuclear and contribute to climate change. So in truth, using the more conservative linear no-threshold model might actually cause more health risks than it prevents. But really, this is a philosophical tangent for another day. Nonetheless, this trade-off of safety at the price of efficiency and financial cost is one that we'll see several times in criticality safety, and it raises many important questions for us to consider. So, at long last, let's discuss the health effects of acute radiation syndrome, which is commonly referred to as radiation sickness. High doses of radiation can certainly cause radiation burns, which are essentially a very severe version of a sunburn, but more significant health effects begin after receiving doses in excess of about one sievert. At this point, the radiation dose causes a hematopoietic effect, which means that the radiation kills your bone marrow and removes your body's ability to produce red and white blood cells. Without white blood cells, our bodies are extremely vulnerable to infection, and without red blood cells, our bodies cannot form blood clots or transport oxygen. Thus, high doses of radiation can kill enough bone marrow in our bodies to be fatal. Thankfully, Bone marrow transplants can restore the body's ability to produce red and white blood cells, which means that this stage of acute radiation syndrome is actually curable and survivable. Undergoing surgery for a bone marrow transplant when you have a zero white blood cell count is certainly risky, but it is nonetheless survivable. A dose in excess of about 6 sieverts will cause gastrointestinal effects where radiation kills the villi that absorb nutrients in our small intestines. Without villi, our GI tract cannot absorb nutrients, which means that gastrointestinal effects are almost always fatal eventually. However, when villi are damaged, the mucous membranes in our GI tract can also break down, which removes our body's natural barriers against the bacteria in our GI tract, which results in significant bacterial infections. These infections are made worse by the fact that we are also suffering from hematopoietic effects at the same time, and that we have a near zero white blood cell count if we receive six sieverts of dose. People who encounter GI effects from acute radiation syndrome die from infection within several weeks, but even if they survive infection, the damage done to their GI tracts is irreparable. Lastly, doses in excess of about 10 sieverts will cause neurological effects which means that radiation begins damaging your nervous system, and possibly your cardiovascular system too. Exposures at this level are invariably fatal, just from the hematopoietic and gastrointestinal effects alone, but the neurological effects from such a huge dose 
generally cause unconsciousness within a few hours due to cerebral edema and meningitis, and then death occurs about two days after that. There are no fun ways to die, but acute radiation syndrome is one of the harder ways to go. I try and keep these lectures light and as entertaining as possible, but the reality is that real people die if criticality safety analysts don't do their jobs, so it's important to take this material very seriously. Now, let's review the first two criticality accidents in the hope of preventing future accidents. I'll designate these accidents as CA1 and CA2, or Criticality Accident 1 and Criticality Accident 2. I'll list these IDs in the lecture video titles for your convenience so that you know which lectures discuss which accidents. These first two accidents took place in 1945 and 1946, respectively, and both involved the infamous Demon Corps. The Demon Corps, whose original codename was actually Rufus, is a 6.2 kilogram sphere of plutonium. Rufus was originally intended to be the pit for the unused third nuclear weapon from World War II, which wasn't necessary after the Japanese surrender ended the war. Rufus was thus repurposed and used for a series of critical experiments at Los Alamos National Laboratory, which was then at the time known as Los Alamos Scientific Laboratory. On the evening of August 21st, 1945, just one week after Japan announced that it would surrender, Harry Daglian went to the movies in the evening and then drove back to Los Alamos Scientific Laboratory to complete a critical experiment that he had been working on with the Rufus Assembly. Daglian was performing this critical experiment after hours and alone, except for a security guard who was also present, which was against the rules. Daglian's critical experiment sought to achieve delayed critical by reflecting Rufus with tungsten carbide reflector bricks. But when he began assembling the experiment, Daglian found that the assembly was much more reactive than he had anticipated. The experiment's neutron detectors indicated that the system's power was rising faster than expected, indicating that Daglian had perhaps already achieved a critical configuration, and that adding one more brick would cause the assembly to go supercritical. Noticing this, Daglian began to withdraw the brick that he was about to add, but either his hand moved the brick too close over the core, or the brick slipped out of his hand and fell onto the core. The second scenario is what most people believe happened, but we don't know for sure either way. The brick caused the core to go prompt supercritical, resulting in a blue flash. This blue flash resulted in about 10 to the 16 fission events before feedback ended the transient and left Daglian with a 5.1 sievert dose. The security guard who was also present received about half a sievert of dose and ultimately survived. The guard, who wasn't looking right at the experiment, saw the blue flash too, which indicates that the blue flash from a prompt supercritical excursion is likely caused by energetic radiation emitting Cherenkov radiation as it moves through the fluid in our eyes. After the blue flash, rather than promptly seeking medical attention and avoiding a dose from the residual delayed fission events, Daglian proceeded to remove the dropped brick from the top of the demon core, and he unstacked the other bricks and disassembled the experiment. We'll discuss this in later lectures, but Daglian significantly increased his dose by sticking around the core. He really should have evacuated immediately. Soon after, Daglian began to show the symptoms of acute radiation syndrome, and he died 25 days later. The second criticality accident involving the Demon Core occurred on May 21, 1946. Louis Sloten was a Manhattan Project veteran at Los Alamos who was scheduled to transfer to the Pacific, where he would act as the chief armor for the nuclear weapons tests in Operation Crossroads. This picture shows Sloten assembling the Trinity device, and if you look closely, you'll notice that this person in the background is none other than Harry Daglian. Sloten was demonstrating an approached critical experiment for Alvin Graves, who was to take over Sloten's role at Los Alamos. Sloten was an experienced experimentalist who helped to assemble the Trinity test device in 1945. The critical experiment Sloten was demonstrating involved reflecting the demon core with beryllium hemispheres. If completely enclosed by the hemispheres, the core would go critical, so the experiment involved placing shims between the beryllium hemispheres to keep them separated. You can see one of the shims in this picture here. It's just a rectangular block. When demonstrating this experiment for Graves, Sloten opted to use a screwdriver 
to separate the two halves of the hemispheres. And eventually, the screwdriver slipped out from between the hemispheres and they slammed together, causing the cord to go prompt supercritical and to emit a blue flash. Sloten had his thumb in a recess in the hemispheres, and he reacted by flipping the hemispherical shell off the top of the core, but it was already too late. The transient was already over before Sloten could even react, although his action did prevent future repeated critical excursions. The supercritical event released 3 times 10 to the 15th fissions, and Sloten, who was bent over the experiment, received a 21 sievert dose. Sloten retained consciousness for several days, but he quickly experienced a total disintegration of bodily functions and passed away nine days after the event. Alvin Graves, who was standing behind Sloten, received a 3.6 sievert dose, thanks in part due to Sloten's body shielding him from an even higher dose, but Graves was hospitalized with acute radiation syndrome. Graves survived ARS and passed away 20 years later from a heart attack. Graves suffered from hypertension before the criticality accident, and his father also died from a heart attack, so the dose that he received may not have contributed to his death. Six others were present in the room during the criticality accident, and each of them received a dose of 2.5 sieverts or less. They all ultimately recovered from any acute radiation syndrome effects. After these accidents, critical experiments at Los Alamos were halted, and the demon core was eventually melted down and recycled for pits in future weapons tests. So what lessons can be learned from these two accidents? Raymer Schreiber was one of the eight people in the room during the Sloten accident, and he has summarized the lessons learned from these accidents in seven points. First, rules did not prevent these accidents. Except for Daglian, who wasn't allowed to be working alone and at night, the established Los Alamos rules were more or less adhered to during these accidents. Sloten performed his experiment with seven other people in the room, and the fact that none of them spoke out when Sloten opted against using the shims suggests that this was perhaps common practice. The experimenters got a little too comfortable with these experiments, to the point that they felt comfortable skirting certain rules when it was convenient. In truth, they probably should have been rotated out to different roles and replaced by fresh experimentalists who were not overly comfortable with performing these experiments. Second, any new critical experiment, such as the one performed by Daglian, should be planned in detail, in advance. These plans should be circulated amongst several responsible people who have the ability to veto the plan or to ask for additional clarification. Had they followed this rule, Daglian might have known that tungsten carbide bricks were more slippery than he first thought, and Sloten might have taken using these shims as a safety measure more seriously. Third, every new assembly should be attended by one or more observers whose job or jobs are to stop any procedure that they consider hazardous. Knowing what we know now, any one of us probably would have told Sloten that using a screwdriver to separate the two hemispheres was an unacceptable risk. Fourth, whenever feasible, a critical experiment should be performed remotely provided that the remote controls incorporate measures to stop any dangerous reactions as soon as possible. If you remove humans from the experiment, then we can accomplish criticality safety's goal of mitigating the impact of any criticality accident. Fifth, a complete account of each assembly should be kept, and ideally it should be recorded and preserved. If we know exactly how the experiment responds to different uncertainties, then fewer things can surprise us during the experiment. Sixth, new critical assemblies should never be reduced to a routine matter that is, quote, run through before lunch. Sloten was known to be very bold, perhaps reckless, in his work, and this recklessness contributed to him performing a critical experiment in a way that was dangerous, but faster and easier. And lastly, a detailed file of all critical assemblies should be kept. Not only can this file warn us against unexpected dangers, but it's also helpful to know what procedures are safe. If a procedure cannot possibly result in a criticality accident, then we can remove some unnecessary safety measures to make this process more efficient. As you can see, these lessons learned are in some ways the foundation of nuclear criticality safety. Criticality safety principles share a lot in common with these initial lessons learned, and they will also build on them. We'll discuss these principles and also the physics of criticality safety 
in future lectures. At this point, we reach the end of the lecture. We will now show some images of Harry Daglian as he began to suffer from the effects of acute radiation syndrome. Again, these images are somewhat graphic, so now is a good point to stop the video in case you don't wish to see them. We won't show anything else in this lecture other than these images, so the remainder of our discussion has now ended. First, to give credit where credit's due, these images are taken from a lecture given by Dr. Ron Neef, who is an expert in criticality safety and a former professor at the University of New Mexico. Now we will begin looking at the images of Harry Daglian as he began to succumb to acute radiation syndrome. The first image shows his hands about 3.5 days after exposure. As you can see, the hands were swelling significantly, and there was significant fluid buildup underneath the skin of his right hand. Hands often suffer significant radiation damage, burns, and are subject to necrosis because they tend to hold objects that are dropped or are moved that cause a criticality accident. This is Daglian's left hand 24 days after the incident. Again, he died 25 days after the incident, so this is the day before he died. And as you can see, the tissue on his hand has become very, very burned. There are white parts that are dead skin, and there are dark parts where gangrene has begun to take hold. His right hand, again, which is the one that was swelling in the previous image, shows some significant gangrene and necrosis on his fingers. Lastly, here's the front of Daglian's body, where you can see that the portion of his body that was facing the assembly during the accident has suffered from significant radiation burns. Daglian died the day after these photos were taken, and I think that looking at these photos really helps to emphasize the importance of doing criticality safety right, since the consequences can be fatal.